The guest on today's episode is a British Asian who went from riches to rags to riches. But he is more than just another immigrant who became successful. A visit to the Dharavi slum in Mumbai led him to take a life-changing decision. His focus shifted from bottom lines of balance sheets to improving the lives of people at the bottom of the pyramid. To tell us more about his fascinating life, Ram Gidumel, CBE, joins us from London today. Ram, you know your life was picture perfect. You were living in the lap of luxury in the capitals of Europe. You know you were one day in France, one day in Switzerland, another day in Scotland. But what <laughs> made you think of Dharavi? Well, um, I'll tell you, I, 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 my business, the, the family business, Inlax, uh, wanted to diversify into European businesses. So we took over these businesses in Scotland: seafoods, prawns, uh, uh, crab, scampi, all the luxury seafoods, and smoked salmon. And uh, but the people in Scotland said to me, "Look, for three months we shut all the factories." I said, "How can you do that?" And they said, "There's no fish." I said, "Nonsense." My granny told me when we were from Hyderabad, Sindh, and Pakistan, and the family in India said, "There's fish throughout the year. Come to India." So I went to India. I was born in Africa, in Kenya. I'd been to India only as a kid of six weeks or seven weeks, uh, seven months old. Now I went back as a businessman. But one of the principles I had in business is. Whoever I do business with, what do they do for their local community? Are they good corporate citizens, not just business citizens? You know, are they really doing work in their communities? So after a ten-day trip around India, visiting all the ports, looking for fish, last day was Bombay. My flight was going back to Scotland. So I asked my uh, uh, friends who were in business, "What do you all do in the local community?" They said, "Oh, we have some community workers. We'll introduce you to them. They'll take you around." So they took me around to a place called Haravi. I wasn't expecting to see this. I in the rickshaw we went. So I went through and I could see these cardboard boxes. I was shocked. I said, "Who lives there?" They said, "Oh, people who can't afford to live in the houses." I said, "What?" Then I went around further. I saw a water pipe and I saw a little boy of five. I said, "Why is he sleeping in the pipe? He can't afford to pay the slum lord." I said, "You know what is this slum lord for the pavements?" It blew my mind. I said, "Where is his dad?" They laughed. "Where is his mom?" They took me around the corner, and I saw these young girls in cages. You know, Sandhya, they had probably only just hit puberty. These girls. It didn't take much imagination for a man to know what they would be going through right through the night. And I was sick physically. I thought this isn't right. Uh, I, I came back to Bombay Airport at, the, at that time. It was Bombay Airport, not Mumbai. Uh, got onto Air France first class. You know, they said first class. You go to the left. Go to the left. They offer caviar, champagne. I said I can't. I don't feel like it. I sat down. The most exquisite food and wines were coming. I said my mind was so shaken and shocked that I said I don't know what to do. When the lights went off, I broke down. And when I came back home to uh, Scotland, when we were living at the time, looking after these seafood factories. I said to my wife, you know, I can't even sit one day on my desk anymore without thinking of that little boy. He's the same age as our young little boy. I can't sit and work. This is just awful. What's happened? So we started chatting. We are both, uh, uh, you know, pray every day. So we prayed together. I said, you know, I want peace about this. I'm shaken. And uh, whenever my wife was saying we should leave because I was working 25 hours a day. <laughs> I said no. I'm enjoying my work too much, and we need the money. Whenever I wanted to leave, she said, "Who will pay the fees of the school? Who will pay the bills?" No, no, no. Keep going. Now, interestingly, she said, "You know what? We are at a point. We don't need a yacht. We don't need a plane. Let's look at our finances and see: Can we go forward to help those we saw in Dharavi, that you saw in Dharavi, that I saw in Dharavi, and see what we can do to make a difference to their lives?" I was 37. And already, when we looked at our account, I said, "You know, we have enough at least for the next few years to keep going without having to earn any more money. But we won't be able to afford the luxuries of life." We said, "We don't need it. What do we need? Basic food, uh, uh, accommodation. We've got a nice little house. The children's uh, school fees, but we'll put them in a state school. In England, it's free. Um, we will give up our private medical insurance. There is a national health service in England. 
So when we looked at all our calculations, we said we don't need this exa exa exaggerated, extravagant lifestyle earning. Let's see what we can do with what we've got reduced. And, you know, I resigned. And then at that point, it was amazing. I met someone who had been to the slums as well. He was a youth worker. And together, we dreamt of a project which really would raise over seven years, five million pounds. I don't know how, many, how much that is in rupees, but five million pounds is like maybe 50, if not 500 crores. It was an incredible amount of money, but that was to help all those poor people, not just in Dharavi. By now, I, I was hearing of projects in Brazil, uh, in, in the favelas, in, in Vietnam, the, uh, in, in, in Africa. And so it became global. And over that period, we sent money right across the globe to help these projects across the globe. But it was the teenagers who did it. We mobilized 50,000 teenagers in Britain. And that was the most exciting, exhilarating thing that, that I did and that I dared to do with my wife at my side all the time, because I only agreed to do this, provided my wife agreed to come with me. So she said, I will manage the diary. <laughs> if the diary says, no, you won't be able to do it. I said, done deal. You're with me. You manage the diary. You tell me where to draw the line. She wanted to keep the children protected. You know, school plays, school prize giving. You've got to be there. You can't just say, I'm too busy now. So all that kind of balance, work-life balance, working together and mobilizing these young people across Britain was just so fulfilling. And from there, other things happened. So I was reading what? the newspaper. Okay. Mm. I want to know, yes. uh, you know, well, what the a single uh, biggest impact uh, did your efforts and the efforts of all the other volunteers who joined you um, what was the biggest impact you had in Dharavi in particular? Oh, in Dharavi in particular, I'll tell you, it was, for example, the uh, girls who came out of prostitution, okay? Because the community workers said, no, now we've got the money to take them out of prostitution, but now what will they do? So the kids here, the young girls here in Britain said, you know, we need uh, these designer, uh, what you call it, scarves and designer hats and things. If we send sewing machines to those girls in Dharavi, even some of us can go and work with them to train them to say, this is what the shops in London are selling. Can you all make it there? And it would be unique because in the shops here, we will say, specially handmade for from the Poor of the poor people who could not previously afford and who had to engage in prostitution. Today, they're producing these goods. Let's help them. So that partnership of the young girls here with the young girls there, uh, to me, the, 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 it was just extraordinary to see the impact on their lives, but the impact on the young people here. Because part of my motivation was, I said, you know, I had been brought up in the life of luxury. I was not aware of these poverty issues. Why was that missing in my education? The young people here need to know that there are needs beyond them and that they are very, very well endowed and well provided for. Do something for those who are less advantaged. So that partnership was very exciting. To me, that was an outcome that you cannot um, buy. You know, It was very soul satisfying to, to see the impact here and there and to see the impact on the lives in therapy. Extraordinary. Ram, you know, um, you had fantastic business skills, which helped you rise in your career and, you know, made you the rising star in the company that you work for. How did you then use those skills to mm. help the charitable yeah. activities that you took up? What were the key yeah. traits that came in useful there? Yeah, you see, I'm an entrepreneur. So I look at opportunity. And say, how do we take advantage of opportunities? So even before my business career rose, we arrived as refugees in London. Okay, as refugees in London, what did we do? Fifteen of us, four bedrooms, in a suburb of London, Shepherd's Bush. Four bedrooms, one bathroom and toilet. Can you imagine? Fifteen of us, eight children getting ready for school with one bathroom and toilet. I used to get up at five and say, I'm having my bath and shower and running. You guys can fight for the bathroom and toilet. I'm on my way to school. But in that shop we ran, what did we see? 
That same shop used to open at seven and shut at five. We are 15 of us. How do we survive from one shop? We need more. What did we do? We opened at four o'clock in the morning, did the newspaper rounds. Now we were supplying newspapers to houses, more margin. Then we noticed in the evening, you know, previously they shut at five, we shut at six, we shut at seven. We noticed at nine o'clock, a lot of people coming from somewhere. We said, where are they coming from? So we went around, we saw they're coming from the bingo hall. This bingo hall where they do the lottery stuff. All the shops are shut. We said, let us open. So nobody else is open. Now, this is opportunity. The same thing has been happening for years. A different pair of eyes is now looking. And suddenly, they're opening at nine for half an hour, making more money, a loss of margin. And suddenly, that opportunity was seen and seized. Or we heard customers coming. And I'm sharing this because these are not called marketing skills, but they were basic, intuitive for me, certainly as a Sindhi, as you know, Sindhis are traders. You know, either Kamal, Udar, Udar, Kamal, either Dono Taraf se Pasa Kamaiga. We are Sindhis. And, and I know in India, they say, you see a Sindhi or a poisonous snake, don't hesitate who to kill first. I always get that joke when I come to India. <laughs> I don't mind because we are traders. And so we saw custom, people coming to the shop, their accent was different, different accent. So we said, you got a different accent. You look white. You look like locals, but you're different accent. They said, we come from Ireland. I said, oh. So we found out where Ireland is. We said, what do you miss from Ireland? They said, these cigarettes are special for us. These newspapers are special for us. These chocolates, these sweets. We got those for them. They paid extra. Within two years, we had six shops. Fantastic. Right. So those, so those skills, when it came to coming back from Mumbai to help the uh, people I've seen in Derby, same thing. We said, now, what can we do? So for one month before Christmas, this is how the five million pounds was raised. Whatever, whether it's 50 crores or 500 crores, five million pounds was raised. How? We got the young people, teenagers. They don't cost anything. They got a lot of energy and time and they get a, a holiday over Christmas for one month. So we said that one month holiday, if you really want to help people, run these restaurants, eat less, pay more. So okay. said, hey, uh, that, how do you that, do that? Yeah. Yeah, so they said, we said, serve dal and chawal, dal and rice, serve baked beans on toast. Some kids were so smart, they had tap water, mineral water, and uh, uh, Coca-Cola, all at the same price, uh, was 50 pence each. Those who wanted to give would take the tap water at 50 pence, free net profit, net margin. That's how over, over, over seven years, 50,000 teenagers raised 5 million pounds. So it's using those skills of entrepreneurship. Then the other one was creating employment. So again, when I ran for mayor of London in 2000, I said, let me engage in politics. Let's try and change the, the, the structure and the country in London, at least the capital of Great Britain. So I ran for mayor of London. People thought I'm crazy. Even I thought, what a silly thing to do. But if you want to change society, get into politics. So I went in. One of the ideas I floated was, in London, there is a part of London that is very, very poor, at least in 2000, high unemployment, high poverty. I said, I want to raise for that area. At that time, I said, in my manifesto, 500 million pounds. So there were 14 other candidates. They all laughed. They said, yeah, this guy, is, you know, he's a businessman. He's done big business and all, but 500 million pounds is a lot to raise. And that was in the year 2000. I can, And it was a very simple idea. Again, a business idea. I said, People have money in their accounts. If they lend it to us for five years without any interest and are guaranteed to pay them back, but from a AAA bank guarantee, are they socially minded people who are prepared to do that? And you know, there are many, okay? But it's not a big amount, 500 million pounds, when you think of the trillions of pounds that are out there. You know, Apple shares alone are worth a few trillion pounds. 500 billion is not a lot. You know, we over, they, they were all laughing at the time. <laughs> Over, the, I retired as chairman after 20 years of that idea. We have raised over one, nearly 1.5 billion pounds from that simple idea. Now, we don't pay zero interest. We said, look, if interest rates are 5%, we'll pay you 2%, 3%. You'll get something. But in addition, you will see a return on the, in your area. Joblessness will go down. Streets will revive. Crime will go down. And it's all for your own benefit and good. Otherwise, you're living in an area where there's heavy unemployment, crime is high. It's just awful. So it's using simple business ideas, nothing complicated. 
giving people a vision, saying, look, think about your community, think about your area, and here are things you could do. And there's so much more I could tell you, Sandhya, that, that has happened in using those simple business skills to make a difference in the lives of the disadvantaged. Right. Ram, you talked about the time that you were a mayoral candidate for the city of London. You know, yes. uh, at last count, there were 20 MPs of Indian origin of different political parties, including Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister. Yes. Why did you choose not to pursue a career in politics? Okay, a very good question. <laughs> but a, in the year 2000, when I ran, I was there were no Indian candidates running in parliament. There was there were very few MPs who were Indian uh, in the in the London Assembly elections. All the Indians were low down the list. It was like you know, and yet I said to all the candidates, one out of seven Londoners are of Asian origin, either Indian or Pakistani or Sikh or whatever. So why are there so few in your political parties? Why is there so much discrimination? So I didn't join any of the main parties. We set up a brand new political party, you know, entrepreneur. <laughs> so a brand new political party was set up and everybody laughed, thinking nothing will happen here. You know what? Out of 15 candidates, I came fourth. I got 100,000 votes, first and second preference. And I beat the Green Party, who had been there for 25 years. Me, after a 100-day campaign, through very sort of uh, creative ideas of uh, publicity. You know, it was just incredible what we could do to get people interested. And it really worked. I, I, I know the question is, so why didn't you continue? You know, in the first election, I must confess, people did not know who I was or what to expect. So there was hardly any attack. Second election, the attack started and the attacks were pretty awful from there's a lot, the racism is, is high and was even higher then, very high. <clears throat> and I, I looked at it and I said, you know what? Uh, I can see that I can spend my life doing this, but the main political parties have such a strong hold that it really is going to be a tough battle. What else can I do? You see, I, I have a principle in life, Sandhya, which says, never let what you cannot do stop you from doing what you can do. Okay, what you cannot do from what you can do. I knew that to shift the mainstream political parties with their billions of pounds supporting them and big business supporting them is a tall order. So I decided I will use again other channels to begin to influence the political landscape. And you know, it started working because by now I'm known. Uh, talking about how racist society was then to talking about the changes that have happened in the mm. last several years. Do you think things have improved um, now and thanks to the efforts of people like you and many others? Th things have improved, but there is still a lot of room to go, a lot. I mean, every day we hear on the news about the racism in the police force, uh, the discrimination even, even in the judicial system. You know, there, there are lots of issues. However, they have improved. I mean, when I got my CBE back in 1997, it was for services to the Asian business community and race relations. Because that is what I was working for all the time, race relations, building bridges. You know, I have a very simple formula. I was doing a lot of training for uh, either political parties or businesses or social enterprises. A, B, C, D, raise awareness. Show them how to build bridges. Make sure we cross the cultural divide. And then, for God's sake, do something. <laughs> Not only talk, talk, talk. So my first book I wrote, by the way, Sandhya, my very first book was Sari and Chips. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's which, which, which a new title. Which, which, yes. <laughs> yeah, which I'll gladly send you with my compliments. And in fact, if you have people listening to the podcast, I give you the full authority and rights to circulate it as openly as you want for free as with my compliments to your lit audience lit listenership. I will send it to you after this call. And it's Sari and Chips, East meets West. And the, I wrote that book because, again, uh, I had now done my Christmas cracker project, which was the one that raised five million pounds. It was called Christmas Cracker. You know, you pull a cracker, you get gifts. I came across a story in the newspaper about a young boy, son of a billionaire, who burnt himself alive 
Oh my God. Because his family would not allow him to marry a girl from a different caste. Simple, in the, in the Asian community. And then I read another statistic, young Asian girls, the attempted suicide rate amongst young Asian girls is four times the national average. I said, why? I didn't have to ask why. I have six sisters. I know the discrimination that the girls in our community in my own family face versus the boys. Boys are always heroes, superior, no problem. Girls, there were issues of dowry and all that nonsense. And I said, this is wrong. We have to talk about it as a community and make sure we do something about this. So I researched it. Four times the national average, that's a disgrace. I wrote my book, Sari and Chips, to raise the issue. And there was a journalist, Sandhya, this is going back now 20, nearly 30 years. Her name was Ramola Bachchan. It is Ramola Bachchan. Oh, and she, Amitabh yeah, so, sister-in-law. Sister-in-law. So she was in London. They were running ZTV. She said, Ram, I want to interview you. I really appreciate what you're doing, especially for these young girls, because she's a woman of passion of, in terms of uh, justice. So she put, me, she put me on her show, radio show. The first one or two calls from old Indian men, Asian men, you know, Pakistani, Indian, whatever. Oh, you are hanging over laundry in public. Don't do this schedule thing. She stopped them all. She said, excuse me, he's calling for discussion. And what's more, he's not making money out of these issues. All profits are going to charity, royalties. I'm not getting anything from them. I've never taken anything from royalties from my books. So they're going to go and help the causes. So that put them quiet. But after three, four calls, families started phoning. We are having these difficulties. Thank you for raising the issue. How can we progress this? Where are the discussion groups? Let's set them up. So Sari and Chips I wrote because of that. And uh, I, I love writing books because I know that if you don't publish, you will perish. You know, you have an idea, it's publish or perish. Very Absolutely. important. Absolutely. I love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, publish or perish. So I said, right. Then I came, uh, uh, then when I ran for mayor of London, again, how do I share my experiences with those who are from my type of background, you know, not white, not Angrezi, not English, who are Indian or African or any other type. You can also run. If I ran and did like this, you can do it. So I wrote my book, very uh, naughty title, How Would Jesus Vote? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so just to stir up the crowd in, in Britain, you know. <laughs> so I wrote that book. And by the way, those are the two books I would gladly send you. Asari and chips, and how would Jesus work? Because it was about how do we run and not be afraid of the society that seems to feel it dominates everything. That's the what? point. A very interesting part uh, of your life, uh, uh, while reading the memoir that occurred to me was, you're so open and frank about the way you went after something that you wanted, be it... Um, getting the woman that you loved to be your wife, or be yes. it, uh, getting onto the boards of various organizations that would boost your profile. Everything was done with a very single minded determination. Two, and, uh, you stress a lot on building relationships. I think it would be very interesting to know, you know, how this idea occurred to you, you know, like, when did you realize that you need to be focused on what you have to do and also how you build networks and relationships that help you achieve your goal, whether it's in business, in your personal life or even in the charitable work that you do? I think that would be yeah. a very inspirational um, information <laughs> to share. Sure. Well, for me personally, I must say, um, you know, I come from a Hindu family, uh, brought up in the Sikh faith as well. Educated in a Muslim school from the age of five till in my best friends today, we still can we communicate with Tiaga Khan school and all my Muslim friends. But in London, I also came across the Bible and that introduced me to someone called Jesus. So when I looked at his life, I said, you know, here is a man who's so simple and look at the impact he has had globally. What can I learn from him? So some of the things I learned were relationships. A, a, a prayer is very important for me. So my wife and I, every morning, the first thing we've done for the last 40, 50 years is pray together. So I'm just giving you that as a background. It doesn't happen instantly because when we pray together, we share, we learn. And what is important is trust gets built up. When trust gets built up, relationships build up. So 
for me, in terms of the wider society at large, for me, a key factor is building relationships. And when I say relationships, you know, it's not like you go to, if we go to a meeting, right? I'm meeting somebody, there's a cocktail. All the time, some, I used to meet people and they're always looking, oh, who's more important, you know, like that. And I'm thinking, don't do that. You're talking with somebody, look them eye to eye, give them your time, give them and build that trust. You never know who you're talking with, where the need is, and who will be a relationship that will be of great benefit. And, the, the, you know, I met like a, a, an English woman uh, a, in one of the societies I was a member of. And uh, when I sent her my book, Sari and Chips, she was so taken by it. She wrote me back. She said, for this book alone, you deserved your title from the queen. But I really appreciate what you've done. How can I help you? So when I told her I'm looking for a seat on the board of this public hospital, she said, you deserve it. I've seen what you're doing. I said, but every time I send an application, they must be seeing my name, Ram, Gidu, Valare, not English, not white, cut him out. She said, I will write to the government minister myself and tell them that I have met you, that I've read your CV and all, and that you are worth considering. That opened the door. But that was the trust built by, I remember still meeting her, talking face to face, sending her the book. And so that, that was, again, important. And that's happened many times in, in my career. And interestingly, it's always been the, because the women have faced the same discrimination. You see, here in Britain, they have faced the discrimination, so they know what that is about. And they therefore help those who are underdogs, who need help. So really, it's important that we do that. And uh, so, so to me, it's relationship, trust, looking people in the eye and not, uh, 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 not using people in a negative or a bad way. But, you know, the point I want to underline, uh, uh, Sandhya, is this. Uh, one of the things that happened to me in that Mumbai uh, Dharavi experience was there is a word called calling. You know, the question is asked, what is your calling? What are you called to do? And I suppose when I saw that little kid in the slum, the calling I got was, what are you going to do for this little kid? And after that, when I heard about the young Asian girls and the four times attempted suicide rate, again, the calling was, so what can you do about what you have heard? And so I wrote my book, Sari and Chips. So every time I saw these issues, it was like, so what is the need and what are you responding to? So when it came to the political, I know for me it was now the bigger issues, the homeless, the jobless, the carless, because I was I reminded of my own arrival in London as a refugee with my family, 15 of us, four bedrooms, one corner shop. So what did we do? And what can we do? So it is always like responding to a need, a call to do something. And, you know, when there is a call, nothing can stop you. And that, that I suppose, has been my experience. Uh, you know, never let what you cannot do stop you from doing what you can do. So what can we do? Uh, it really is about building that trust, building the confidence of people and uh, not using and exploiting people, but saying, building trust and saying, look, how can we help one another? And when they see, I was trying to do good, not for myself, but for the community. People bend over backwards to help you. And that has been my experience uh, all the time. And, and, and I know that bringing communities together, you know, sometimes there can be community tensions here in Britain. Sometimes there, there was a tension between the Hindus and the Muslims here, the, especially after the uh, Godra riots and uh, all the events in India. The tensions overspilled here. What did I do? The business community asked me, can you bring together these two communities to talk with one another and not throw bricks at each other? Because that's what was happening. Bricks were being thrown into mosques and temples. How do you stop that? Get people talking. So I brought, I brought literally extremists from both sides of the community. And it was an incredible conference we held in London following the, the riots in India. And it achieved peace, dialogue, and an understanding that people appreciated and said, it's much better we do that than, uh, than, than fight with each other here. It's not good. The book I wrote to coincide with 75 years of India's independence and 75 years since partition took place when we, were, when we lost everything. And interestingly, it was 50 years after we were thrown out of Africa. So there was quite a milestone, this book. 
But it was uh, not saying how awful and how bad life has been, but say, look, all that may have happened. We may have lost everything materially, but the book is called My Silk Road. And in My Silk Road, I want it to be a book that everybody who reads it can say, I too can have My Silk Road. Because this is a silk road that everybody can have if only they're prepared to learn from at least some of the examples I've shared and put them into practice. They've written for my grandchildren. Can you please read the last uh, paragraph? Uh, you know, I think I, it would be very interesting for our audience to. Wow, the last paragraph of 266. You know, over the course of my life, start from there. Yes, 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 of course, of course. I'll, I'll gladly read it from my book, absolutely. <laughs> Over the course of my life, there were some roads I did not choose, some I did. But whether or not we have chosen the path we're on, we can always choose how we walk it. As for me, I chose to simplify my lifestyle, to find a different road, one which ironically led me to riches of greater worth than I could have imagined, a road where the obstacles were many, but never insurmountable. A road of compassion that left me with a peaceful heart. A road that led me far and wide, but took me right where I belonged. My chosen path. My silk road. I must say, Ram, that I really enjoyed reading this book. It had been on top of the pile of there were several books that I planned to read and when I finally remembered late one night I picked it up and I just kept reading right through and wow. uh, my compliments for the ease with which you write and it's honest writing it's very moving and uh, once again thank you the author of My Silk Road Ram Gidumal for joining us on this podcast today all the way from London Thank you, Sylvia. You're very kind and I so, so appreciate your kind, warm comments on the book. I've enjoyed uh, uh, dialoguing with you on this interview. Thank you. And to our listeners, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Spotlight with Sandhya as much as I did. Do subscribe to the podcast. I would love to hear from you. The links are in the bio below. I'll be back soon with another interesting guest. Until then, take care and bye-bye.